in another video we began the analysis of this cinematic universe with the legend of the Nahuala. Now it's the turn of the legend of La Llorona, which is one of the most emblematic legends in Mexico. So let's provide a brief summary of it and then highlight its strengths and weaknesses. To place ourselves in the time frame these movies are set in. Let's remember that the battle Leo San Juan and his company had against the Nahuala took place in 1870 in Puebla, on the night of November 2nd, the Day of the Dead, with the Nahuala defeated a year past. Now, in 1808, on another Day of the Dead, the ghostly father Godofredo tells him that he must go to Xochimilco to confront La Llorona. Thus, in this second movie, Leo San Juan and his company embark on a hot air balloon journey from the city of Puebla to the then capital of New Spain to reach the Chinampa area of Xochimilco. In Xochimilco, we see two children asking for Calaverita, Candice, and one of them being kidnapped by La Llorona. Upon arriving at the site, all characters in the balloon are attacked by a storm, causing the protagonist to land somewhere in Xochimilco, separated from the Alebrije and the rest of the company, who land in another area. Subsequently, Leo is found by the sister of the kidnapped Chill and is taken to her home. There, the mother of the girl tells him the story of La Llorona, referring to her as a woman named Yolcin, who once arrived in Xochimilco with her children, Olin and Tonatiu. She seemed to be a strong and determined mother. As time passed, she gained the affection of the local people. However, one night, upon returning to her Chinampa, it was engulfed in flames. In her attempt to extinguish the fire, she forgot about her children, who were carried away by the current. They passed as the Olotzin searched for her children, and they were eventually found dead in one of the canals. Jolsin suffered great sorrow over the loss and later died. But time after, the cries of a woman in Xochimilco mourning her children began to be heard. As a result of this, young children began to disappear because of La Llorona, giving rise to her legend. With this story told, the plot of the movie unfolds. On one hand, thanks to the diary of a friar who was searching for La Llorona, Leo San Juan begins to search for her along with the girl who rescued him. On the other hand, Leo's friends arrive at the famous island of the dolls where the dolls come to life and begin to attack them. On Leo's side, La Llorona confronts him several times, also kidnapping the girl who was with him, while the Alabrije and his company defeat the dolls and the house where they live. In the greetings of the Xochimilco friar, it is mentioned that La Llorona should see the grace of her children in order to find peace. and these graves and her hildo are located in a church connected to the Chinampas. Leo eventually reaches this church but faces difficulty in tearing. He discovers that La Llorona had been keeping the kidnapped children there, believing them to be her own. Leo tries to rescue them by searching among the graves, which belonged to his own children. At that moment, his companions join him in the battle, and they fight against La Llorona, just when it seems all is lost. Leo finds the graves on his two children. With this discovery, La Llorona is pacified, and through the power of the script, the spirits of her children appear to her, taking the protagonist for this. He also sees the spirit of his deceased mother, the spirits then move towards the light, and all the kidnapped children are rescued. 
The film concludes with the next adventure, which involves battling the mummies of Guanajuato. Now, let's move on to the analysis of the historical context. Obviously, the legend of La Llorona in Mexico is iconic, and even today, there are many places in the country where it is said that a spirit cries out at night. There are numerous accounts and stories related to these legends. However, the tale of Yolotzin is not one of them, as it was invented for the movie. When discussing the original La Llorona, she was not named as such and her story did not have any connections to Yolcin or take place around 1808. Well, its earliest origins would be years before the arrival of the Spanish. Of course, those who mention it are Spanish sources. Starting with Friar Diego Duran, who noted that during the days of the Wait Latuani Moctezuma II, it was reported that a woman cried and moaned at night, Moctezuma asked that if they saw her, they should inquire why she was crying and moaning. Another friar who documented La Llorona was friar Bernardino de Sagún, through his indigenous informant. Many times it was heard, a woman was crying. She went crying at night. She was shouting loudly. My little children, now we have to go far away. My little children, where shall I take you? They said that at night she would shout and belong in the air. The friar did not call her La Llorona, but rather Siwakoatl, woman serpent, or Tonantzin, or mother. A Tlaxcaltecan historian named Muñoz Camargo recounts, The sixth prodigy and synced was that many times and many nights a woman's voice was heard crying loudly and saying, drowned in tears and great sobs and sighs, Oh, my children, we are going to be completely lost. And other times she said, Oh, my children, where can I take you and hide you? So, was this prehispanic La Llorona true or false? We will never know. But, if we consider the nearly 300 years gap between the original Siwakoatl and the Yolcin in the movie, from before 1519 to 1808. Continuing with the prehispanic touch, we have the names of this La Llorona and her children. Her name was Yolcin, unlike Siwakoatl or Tonantzin. What could this name mean? This could be a compound word composed of Yol and Tzin. The Yol part could be a contraction of another Nahuatl word, which would be Yolot, meaning heart. Meanwhile, the Tzin is a honorific suffix added to names to show respect or deference towards the person referred to by the name. For example, saying Moctezumatzin or Cuauhtemoczin. Obviously, adding the sin was not something self-given by the person, but rather something that others had to recognize as a certain honor and recognition. Therefore, in the pre-Hispanic era, not just anyone could add the reverential Tessin to their name. It's somewhat akin to what happens in the United Kingdom today when someone is addressed as Lord, Lady or Sir. Therefore, self-appointing as Yolotzin would be somewhat presumptuous if we're very strict about it from this woman's perspective. The possible translation of Yolotzin would be something like Venerable Heart. Now, let's move on to the children, Olin and Tonatiu. Olin means movement in Spanish, and it was one of the 20-day signs 
in this part of the so-called Aztec calendar. I don't think the creators of the movie went so deep as to imply that this shield was born on a movement day according to the Tonalamat. So, his name might not have been that significant in this context. As for the other shield, Tonatiu translates to Sun. Hopefully, they plan these names for a particular reason. If we combine both names, we would have all in Tonatiu, better known in Spanish as Son of Movement. In other words, their names might allude to the 50 era in which humans were born, the son represented in the center of the Tonal Machot. According to myths, this son was born in Teotihuacan through the sacrifice of Nanahuatzin, Tecusistecatl and other deities. The sun came after the eras of water, rain, wine, and jaguar. So, in reality, these names of La Llorona's children did have a profound meaning in accordance with the pre-Hispanic worldview. Now, let's move on to discussing aspects not tied to historical context. The quality of animation improved compared to the previous film obviously with private funding. However, in this one, they took more liberties than in the previous one, mixing elements from various sources. Even if they didn't quite match the early days of the independence era. For instance, they mentioned the island of the dolls, where a significant part of the action takes place. The concept of the island, the myth, and the dolls only began to emerge in the mid-1950s. This means that in 1808 such a place could not have existed in Xochimilco. The characters, especially Teodora, engage in exaggerated a trendy dialogue along with a more fashionable wardrobe change. At least it's appreciated that they didn't resort to the kind of humor seen in some other animations. Here, there's obviously a syncretism between European and indigenous elements, as seen in the tradition of Pedir Calaverita. During the Day of the Dead on November 1st and 2nd, a celebration that didn't exist in the pre-Hispanic era. Even though La Llorona's children have Nahuatl names, they were buried in a Christian church, gathering to the rites of the new religion that supplanted ancient beliefs. Overall, they did a good job depicting the Chinampas area, the houses and churches of that region, some of which still exist today, albeit without wild asholots. Nowadays there are annual, theatrical representations of La Llorona around the Day of the Dead. Just like the previous film, this is an effort to make our myths and legends accessible. This time, they delve a bit deeper into the historical facts behind the legend of La Llorona, despite it being an animated feature.